<clears throat> so in this chapter, we're going to start talking about aromatic compounds. But before we get exactly into that, I want to do a little bit of a demonstration. And so I've got three vials up here. One is cyclohexene diluted in methylene chloride. The other is benzene diluted in methylene chloride. And the last one is a few drops of brom molecular bromine dissolved in methylene chloride. So what is cyclohexene? How would I draw it? Okay, so here we have cyclohexene. What's benzene look like? All the same thing, but you won't have bonds either. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I take cyclohexene and I react it with bromine and methylene chloride, what's going to happen? right we're going to add bromine across the carbon carbon double bond right good in what fashion anti right so we're going to end up with plus it's an antimer which doesn't really matter here what might we expect based on this for benzene Benzene's got three double bonds, right? Might we expect that we would get bromine added across the three double bonds? It would just take three times as much bromine to do it, right? And we might expect to see something that looks like this. Right? We might expect to see something like that. And we're going to test that to see if that's true today using the bromine test, okay? So we've talked about this before, and we've, we've hinted at this a little bit from time to time, but today we're going to test it. So what can you tell me about the color of the bromine solution? It's dark, it's red, it's kind of a reddish-orange, right? Uh, bromine's a nasty compound to work with. That's why I made a very dilute solution. And so we're going to start off with the cyclohexene. So what's going to happen as the bromine reacts with the cyclohexene, what's going to happen to the color? It's going to go clear, right? And so, or at least it should, so we're going to test that. I'm going to take, take a little bit of dilute bromine here. And it wants to bubble everywhere. And as I'm adding it, what can you tell me about the color? It's still clear, right? You're going to get a whiff of this, though. Now, we take a little bit of benzene, and I'm going to add a few drops of the bromine solution to it. And what can you tell me about the color? It is not clear, is it? It failed the bromine test. So what does that tell us? We don't have any electrophilic addition, right? Why? Are those really double bonds that, are, that we can think of like cyclohexane? No. Each one of these carbons is sp2 hybridized just like these two carbons are. There is p orbitals on each one of those. But the chemistry is actually quite different. And so today, we're going to talk about aromatic compounds. And it turns out that benzene is aromatic. When you all think about the, the word aromatic, what do you all think about? Pardon? Aroma. Yeah, so if you're cooking, right, you got your blue apron in and you're starting to cook and... You know, it'll say cook until it becomes aromatic or aroma, right? Yeah. That's not what an organic chemist thinks. An organic chemist thinks when they hear the word aromatic, they think unusually stable or unusually unreactive in, a, in, a, in this sense, right? We would have predicted 
from the chemistry that we already know that three double bonds should have added three times the amount of bromine and it should have gone colorless and yet that's not what happened okay so we're going to talk about that uh, today and we'll talk a little bit about some of the reactivity of benzene and get into discussions of aromaticity okay so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that so we just did this experiment hey here you got the yeah if you just grab those for me thank you and they can just go in the organic waste Thank you very much, sir. Huh? Bleach. So we just did this experiment. We took an alkene. We didn't take ethylene. We took cyclohexene because cyclohexene is a liquid, and ethene is what? What do you think, polymer people? You all work with polyethylene? What's ethylene? Is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? a gas. I didn't want to work with gases in here if I could avoid it. So I picked an alkene that was that was a liquid, okay? And so we got the addition product from the cyclohexene, just like we would expect that we would get, uh, and the bromine color disappeared. However, benzene, when we added the bromine, we saw no reaction, meaning that these double bonds, and I'm putting them in air quotes here, right? These double bonds of the aromatic ring are obviously less reactive than just an isolated alkene all by itself. Okay? And so benzene has four degrees of unsaturation. Can you tell me where the unsaturations come from? The ring is one and the three pi bonds. That's right. So anytime you all calculate an unsaturation number from a molecular formula and you see an unsaturation of four, it should, when it doesn't have to be benzene, but it should signify maybe there's a benzene ring in the molecule, okay? That's usually where I start with when I'm, when I'm doing those types of things, okay? Now, benzene, if you look at the structure, right, it's a six-membered ring with three additional degrees of unsaturation. It is planar. Build a model. All six atoms lie in the plane, all six carbon atoms and all the hydrogens lie in the plane of your paper when you're drawing it, okay? All carbon-carbon bonds are of equal length. If I take this molecule and I grow a crystal of it at low temperature and I go put it on an X-ray diffractometer and I look at the X-ray structure, all the carbon-carbon bonds are the same length. Does that make sense based on the hybridization? Right, the way we have it drawn, this should be a short bond, this should be a long bond, this should be a short bond, this should be a long bond. This should be a short bond. That should be a long bond. It actually should look something like this, right? But because of resonance and because it's a conjugated system, all the carbon-carbon bond links are exactly the same. And so the way that we draw it here is actually misrepresenting the actual structure a little bit, okay? And in fact, in order to compensate for some of that sometimes, you will see in some books where they will draw a benzene ring with a circle in it, meaning that those six pi electrons are actually completely delocalized across those six carbon atoms. And so, uh, but most drawing programs today actually draw benzene like this, not like this. Uh, and so if you look at that, you might think long, short, long, short, long, and that's just not the way it is. Okay, if it were that way, we would actually have benzene that would look like this. And if we had benzene that looked like this, it would have added bromine very, very easily because actually what we would have had here because of these long bonds, we would have had three isolated alkenes that would have done the typical chemistry that you might expect. Okay? Now, if you look at uh, a typical carbon-carbon bond, about one and a half angstroms. If you look at a typical carbon-carbon double bond, about 1.3 angstroms. And lo and behold, if you look at the carbon-carbon bond links of benzene, just under 1.4 angstrom, so somewhere in between, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely, right? We expect each bond to have some double bond character and to also have some single bond character, right? Because of the resonance structures that we can draw. The hybrid is actually uh, a mixture of all of these things, right? And so we can draw multiple resonance structures for benzene. 
If you look at the benzene molecule, build the model, you end up with a structure that looks like this with your model kit, right? You've got 120 degree bond angles, everything's sp2 hybridized as you would predict. Each p orbital it has an electron, if you will, and so that's where we get our six electrons, okay? So benzene is planar, it is cyclic, it is conjugated, it is sp2 hybridized at every atom, and all that's gonna be important in our definition of aromaticity that is coming up, okay? There are a few things that you need to know about benzene derivatives in terms of naming them, okay? Um, typically, the easy way to get away with some of this is just to name the substituent and then add the word benzene. So here, obviously, we have an ethyl group attached to a benzene ring. It's ethyl benzene. Here we have a tert butyl group attached to a benzene ring. It's tert butyl benzene. Here we have a chloro group attached to benzene. It's chloro benzene. Pretty straightforward kind of nomenclature. And we'll learn uh, later on what it's like if you have more than one substituent. Then it starts to get a little more tricky. But typically, just name the substituent and then call it benzene, okay, for these simple ones like this. Uh, some of the monosubstituted benzenes that have been around for an awful long time have common names that you need to know. Okay, so for example, that's a methyl group attached to a benzene ring. There's absolutely nothing wrong with calling it methyl benzene. The only problem is nobody calls it methyl benzene. They call it toluene, okay? Toluene is a very good industrial solvent. It is less toxic than benzene by itself. Benzene is actually quite toxic. Um, it is used in some paint thinners. You can go to Lowe's and buy it off the shelf to dilute your paint that you're painting your house with, the whole nine yards. Uh, people also use it to degrease tools when they're working out in their garages, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but methylbenzene, you also need to know that that's toluene, okay? Hydroxybenzene, makes perfect sense to name it that way, except nobody calls it hydroxybenzene. We call it phenol, okay? Phenols are very good... Uh, Molecules for a variety of pharmaceuticals, for example. Uh, many throat uh, numbing things that you do when you've got a cold will contain a derivative of phenol that actually uh, deadens uh, the pain. Okay, so it's actually quite useful. Uh, it looks like an alcohol, and it behaves like an alcohol in a lot of respects, except for its acidity. Would you suspect that phenol is more acidic or less acidic than a typical primary alcohol? Less acidic? How would, we, how would we determine that? This is a good, ex this is a good, ex we'd look at its conjugate base, right? So let's do that, let's do that experiment. So here we have phenol. And let's just use, um, uh, let's use ethanol to compare. So how do I compare them? What do I have to do to, to look at the conjugate base? What do I have to remove? Which one? I've got lots of hydrogen. I'm going to remove the proton on the oxygen, right? So that's the conjugate base of phenol. This is the conjugate base after the deprotonation of uh, ethanol. Which one of those is more stable? Why? That's right, I can draw resonance structures that push the negative charge into the ring. That's right, and that's a minus charge. Oops, put it out there. There we go. And I can draw other resonance structures, right? Can I draw any resonance structures for the phenox or the ethoxide? No. So wh now, what's our prediction? More acidic or less acidic? More acidic, by a little bit or a lot? By a lot. Turns out ethanol has a pKa somewhere around what? 16-ish, yeah, in that ballpark, right? Close enough. Where would you predict for phenol? Too low. 10 is the exact number, yeah. So phenols have a pKa of around 10, primary alcohol somewhere around 16. Now does that sound like a big difference? That's six pKa units, right? And a pKa is, is a log, right? So that's 10 to the six, that's a million. That's a, that's a lot more acidic, right? So uh, yeah, phenol is a lot more acidic than is 
uh, ethanol. In fact, I can take phenol, put it in a separatory funnel, and add sodium hydroxide, and it will completely deprotonate it. Okay? Whereas I cannot do that with uh, ethanol. Okay? If you put a amino group on benzene, it makes sense to call it amino benzene, but nobody calls it that. We call it aniline. And anilines are very, very important molecules. We'll talk about them an awful lot. They are useful for a variety of legitimate and illegitimate reasons. Legitimately, they are used for making uh, dyes that color our clothes. Anilines are big, useful molecules, or a big class of molecules that are used in the dye industry. Anilines are also used as precursors in the development of explosives. You might remember back during the early 2000s when we were at, uh, in conflict in Iraq, they mentioned that they'd found drums of aniline and that that was proof that they were developing weapons. It wasn't proof of anything. Could have been, I mean, in and of itself, you have to have other information, right? Aniline has a variety of uses. That's one possible use. The other possible use is maybe they were making dyes. I don't know, right? Probably not, but nonetheless, in and of itself, it wasn't evidence of, of anything like that, just to say we found quantities of aniline. I got quantities of aniline in my, in my laboratory, not making any explosives, okay? Nomenclature of benzene derivatives uh, continued. If we have more than one substituent, we have to worry about the numbers, right? Methyl benzene, doesn't matter where you put the methyl group, it's always gonna be toluene, right? But when we put more than one substituent on, we can put substituents on where they're in a 1-2 relationship, a 1-3 relationship, or a 1-4 relationship, okay? Now you could call this 1-2 dibromobenzene, you can call this 1-3 dibromobenzene, and you can call this one 1-4 dibromobenzene. And those would get you perfectly good answers on a test. However, organic chemists rarely name them this way. When you have two substituents that are in a 1-2 relationship, we say that this is ortho. This is ortho-dibromobenzene, okay? And so you will write ortho-dibromobenzene, or you can abbreviate it as O-dibromobenzene. When we have the substituents in a 1-3 relationship, this is known as meta, and so we call this meta-dibromobenzene. And when you have the two bromines in a 1-4 relationship, this is called a para-relationship, okay? And so we would call this para-dibromobenzene. Uh, those little bathroom cakes that they use, right, that smell, that's actually uh, para-dichlorobenzene, okay? And um, it helps mask a lot of things, okay? So, uh, so those little things you hang on the side of your toilet bowl and all that kind of stuff, or, or at least the old ones were paradichlorobenzene, okay? And so you had the chlorines in a 1-4 relationship. There are some aromatic compounds other than benzene that you need to know something about. Uh, for example, uh, benzopyrene. This is a, a fairly large molecule. It's not huge, but it's a lot bigger than benzene. In fact, if you look at it, it kind of looks like there's a benzene ring here, a benzene ring here, benzene ring here and a benzene ring here, but actually this is all one aromatic unit, which we'll learn more about later, okay? This is what happens uh, that you inhale when you burn a tobacco leaf, okay? And it turns out that benzopyrene actually gets oxidized in your liver into a carcinogenic compound. That's where the carcinogens come from, okay? And so these things get oxidized, oxygens get placed on them, all of a sudden you make uh, molecules that are that are carcinogenic, okay? So uh, a lot of aromatic compounds, in this particular case, we call this a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Why would we call it polycyclic? It's got a lot of rings. How many rings does it have? How many disconnections do we have to do to get it completely open? One, two, three, or did I miss one? One, two, three, four, and then cut anywhere else and we'd have five. That's right. Yep. So it's got five rings. Uh, some other interesting things in the medicine field. Uh, Zoloft, also known as uh, sertraline. This is one of the most widely prescribed uh, antidepressive 
an antipanic disorder drugs on the market today. It is a multi-billion dollar drug uh, annually in terms of sales. Notice it has an aromatic ring here, a benzene ring, and it also has a benzene ring here. How are these two chlorines with respect to one another? They are ortho. They're in a one-two relationship. Okay? But notice it's a, fairly, um, it's a fairly simple molecule when you look at it, but it does contain two aromatic rings. It's got what kind of an amino group here? That's a secondary amine, and we've got a bond here. How many chiral centers do you see? There are two. This is a chiral center, and this is a chiral center. And what they don't show you is how these are with respect to one another in this particular drawing. But I believe, if memory serves, that they are uh, cis to one another. Okay. Valium, very powerful sedative, aromatic rings. Uh, Novocaine, right? What's Novocaine used for? Yeah, but where do you, where have you come into contact with Novocaine before? At the dentist, right? Uh, if you're like me, you hate it when the dentist starts coming at you with a needle, right? Nobody wants to feel that. So what do they do? They, they stick a stick in your mouth, right, with, a, with some Novocaine on it for a few minutes. It tastes like crap, right? It gets on your tongue. It's about to talk like this, right? All kinds of things. That's right. And so the Novocaine gives a little local deadening so that when they, with the needle, you don't jump out of your skin, right? And so Novocaine works really, really well. In the past, uh, we used to have students, uh, not here, not since I've been here, but when I was in graduate school, we would have students uh, as, a, as a laboratory synthesize Novocaine uh, to kind of give them something kind of realistic. But we kind of stopped doing it. Can anybody tell me why? A lot of students were getting local anesthetic feelings on their fingers for not wearing their gloves and, you know, oh, they can't feel anything. And then they'd burn themselves. And so it's just not a good idea. So. Uh, we don't do that anymore, uh, but it's a simple molecule, right? We've got an aromatic ring. What's this functional group? We've got an ester. What? If I take this whole thing, what would you say this is? Aniline. It's an an well, yeah, it's, it's para. They're, they're para to one another, but it's also an aniline derivative, right? So this is an aniline molecule, if you will. And what kind of amine do we have here? Tertiary. Tertiary. That's right. That's right. So novocaine, also known as procaine is useful. Uh, Virocep, this is an antiviral drug used in, uh, in HIV treatment. Notice we have aromatic rings. Uh, here we have a benzene, but also we have what? That's a phenol, right? So we have a phenol, we have an aromatic benzene. It's also part of uh, when I have a sulfur that's bound to two carbons, what do we call this functional group? It's a sulfide, that's right. So this, we have a sulfide that has this, we have a phenol, we have amides, we have amines, we have other amides, we have an alcohol. A lot of functional groups coming together to make this anti-HIV drug. Uh, Viagra, a little blue pill, right, has an aromatic ring. You can see it right there. It's part of an ether, uh, sulfonamide, and then this whole other stuff that's out here that we won't talk about. And then Claritin. What are you, when, when are you all going to start taking your Claritin? By about next month, right? Many of you will be taking Claritin, over-the-counter antihistamine. Some of you may be taking it now for your seasonal allergies. But nonetheless, notice there's an aromatic ring. This, too, is an aromatic ring. But what's different from this aromatic ring and this aromatic ring? This one only has five carbons. It also has a nitrogen. So it has a heteroatom in the aromatic ring, and we'll talk about that, okay? But nonetheless, all of these medicines contain aromatic rings in them, and so they are aromatic compounds by definition, okay? And so this is the odd thing to think about. Benzene, C6H6, is a carcinogen. You don't want to be around it if you don't have to, okay? But derivatives of benzene become powerful medicines. So what's the take-home message there? It's all about structure, isn't it? We alter the structure, we can go from something that's very carcinogenic to something that's actually quite useful, right? I'm very thankful that Novocaine works and doesn't cause cancer, right? Because I don't like needles when I go to the dentist, okay? So if we think about um, 
this idea of aromaticity. I've told you that it means unusually stable. Well, unusual is kind of a touchy-feely word, and we're scientists. We don't like touchy-feely words. We like numbers and units on those numbers, right? We like to assign things like that. So let's think about this. And one of the things that we can measure is the heat of a reaction using calorimetry, just like you did in general chemistry, right? And so we could actually take cyclohexane and hydrogenate it to cyclohexane. Add hydrogen across the carbon-carbon double bond in the presence of a catalyst, and we can measure the amount of heat that's given off. Does it make sense that that should give off heat? Let's start with that. Why? Okay, so that takes, that doesn't give off heat to break a bond. That, that doesn't give off heat, that takes heat. Okay, so which bonds am I forming? No. Well, I mean, you're, you're not wrong, but it's not the type I'm looking for. What? Two sigma bonds. So I'm sacrificing a weak pi bond, that's taking energy in, right? And I'm gaining what? Two strong sigma bonds, which are releasing energy, right? And so the reaction lies to the right, and it gives off just under 29 kilocalories per mole of heat for every carbon-carbon uh, double bond that we have here. We only have one. So we might expect that for every carbon-carbon double bond we have in a molecule, we'd get about 29 kilocalories per mole of heat, right? And that's true as long as those double bonds are isolated and they're not in, in uh, conjugation with one another. So if we take, for example, 1,3-cyclohexadiene, okay, we have a diene, which could be used in the Diels-Alder reaction, for example, right? But we have this diene. It is conjugated. We do the hydrogenation, and we notice that we get about 55 kilocalories per mole of heat out of this. Well, if I, if I use this as my, as my example up here, the cyclohexene, I would expect to get about 57 kilocalories per mole, because 2 times negative 28.6, right? So I would expect to get about that much heat out if these were isolated. But it's not quite that, right? And that difference is the resonance stabilization, okay? But that's still a fairly small difference. That's not huge. But it is a difference, and we can measure it. However, if we look at benzene, and if I can hydrogenate it, and you can, but you've got to kind of beat on it to, for it to happen, okay? I get cyclohexane just like I did in these other examples, and notice what I get out. I get out just under 50 kilocalories per mole. But 3 times 28.6, if it was actually three isolated alkenes, I should have gotten almost 86 kilocalories per mole of heat out. I would argue that that difference right there is quite large. And it's that difference in stability that is really the aromatic uh, stuff that we're talking about. Okay. I wouldn't have expected that large a difference based on what I saw here. That tells me that this molecule is aromatic. It is unusually stable, and I can quantify that unusual stability through this experiment. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody get that? So we're going to see unusual reactivity with benzene. Benzene doesn't like to add things to its double bonds. Cyclohexene loves to do it. How about... 1,3-cyclohexadiene loves to do it. We talked about adding things across a conjugated system, right? If we take this molecule and we add HBr, let's say one molecule of H or one uh, mole of HBr for one mole of 1,3-cyclohexadiene, at really low temperature, what kind of addition do we get? Not para. At really low temperature. Would we get 1,2 addition or 1,4 addition? 1,2. One, two. Remember, at really low temperature, it does the 1,2 addition. Now, if Dane runs this at room temperature, what's he going to get? Then he's going to get 1,4, and it's going to look like uh, you added the hydrogen here and the bromine there, right? So, yeah, we can do all that kind of stuff. But benzene, it just sits there and looks at us. You could go down right now into the lab, and you could pick up that vial we just did, and the it's still colored, kind of an orangish red color. Benzene's just staring at the bromine and going, I don't want to work, react with you, right? It's happy the way that it is, okay? And so this is what we would have if we imagine benzene as having three isolated double bonds. We talked about that earlier. 
And if we hydrogenated this molecule, we would expect to get just under 86 kilocalories per mole of energy out in that reaction. But benzene is actually lower in energy than this hypothetical molecule. It's somewhere here. And so when we hydrogenate it, we only get just under 50 kilocalories per mole of heat energy out. Okay? And it's this difference, this 36 kilocalories per mole lower in energy, this is the, this is the aromatic stabilization. Okay? That is the aromatic stabilization of that particular molecule. Okay. So this is the exact experiment we just did right here. When I added the bromine to this solution, did, did you see any color remaining? I mean, as soon as the drop hit, it went colorless, didn't it? Absolutely colorless. I mean, it was rapid. It was quick. And in fact, I was holding it in my hand, and I could feel it getting warm. Does that make sense? Should it get warm? Absolutely, because I'm breaking a weak pi bond and I'm making strong sigma bonds, right? So yeah, that made sense. But I also know when I added the bromine, I didn't use carbon tetrachloride, I used methylene chloride, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we saw no reaction with benzene. And we see the same kind of thing when we look at other reactions that we've talked about. If I take potassium permanganate cold, I see rapid hydroxylation. What would the product be if I took cyclohexene and KMNO4 and kept it cold. What? Cis what? For potassium permanganate? A diol. That's right. I would get the dihydroxylation. They would be cis. But if I take this solution of KMNO4, add it to benzene, nothing's going to happen. If I use a strong acid like HI or HBr, again, rapid addition, no reaction. If I take hydrogen, in this case, they're using nickel as the catalyst, not palladium. But I can hydrogenate this at room temperature and just a little bit of hydrogen gas. In fact, I don't even have to have it at 20 PSI. I can just use a, a little kid's balloon full of hydrogen and put on top of it, and it'll hydrogenate this thing. But to get benzene to hydrogenate, I can do it. But look what I have to do. I have to heat this thing up to over 100 degrees Celsius and I have to put on it 1,500 pounds per square inch of, of hydrogen pressure. Do you know what we call that? A bomb, OK? If you take hydrogen gas, which goes boom, and you heat it up to over 100 degrees, and you put 1,500 PSI on it, you have a literal bomb in your laboratory, OK? And we don't like doing that kind of stuff, right? It's kind of dangerous. So. Yeah, I can kick it hard enough to do the chemistry, but I'm going to put myself at risk doing it, okay? And so you have to have very special equipment to do these types of hydrogenation, which many of us in this, in this department have this special equipment to do this, but nobody really likes to do it because you never know. You come in one day and your lab's all blown to pieces, okay? Now, we have learned that uh, benzene doesn't like to do addition chemistry, just like we t for an alkene. However, benzene is reactive. It does do some chemistry. So for example, if I take benzene and I take bromine in the presence of iron tribromide as a catalyst, I do some chemistry. What chemistry am I doing? Substitution. What am I substituting? All right, I'm going to substitute and take off a hydrogen and put on a bromine, right? Okay. And so notice what's happening here. In this topic example, if we could do the addition, I no longer have a benzene ring. Is this molecule aromatic or non-aromatic? It is not aromatic, that's right. However, if I do a substitution, what do I have? I still have an aromatic ring. So benzene doesn't like to do addition chemistry. It doesn't mean it won't do it, but it doesn't like to. Okay but it will do substitution chemistry in the presence of a uh, catalyst, an appropriate catalyst, in this case iron tribromide, which we'll talk more about later. Okay. What kind of substitution reactions have we learned about so far? SN1 and SN2. SN1 involves what? Carbocations. And SN2 involves? It's concerted. It's all one step. It turns out, in this chapter, we're going to learn an additional mechanism. Okay? When we're talking about aromatic, there's a, there is a 
arom electrophilic aromatic substitution mechanism. And in a way, it kind of looks like an SN1 mechanism because we do generate a carbocation, okay? But it's different, okay? And we'll learn about those differences in, this, in, this, uh, in these next two chapters, okay? So you all need to know the criteria for aromaticity. Right now, if I gave you a list of molecules and said, which ones are aromatic, what would you do? You would look for something that kind of looks like a benzene ring, right? But there are molecules that do not look anything like a benzene ring that are perfectly aromatic because they satisfy four criteria. And we're going to talk about those criteria, okay? You need, and I'm going to, I don't say this often, you need to memorize these criteria. These criteria, you need to be able to roll off your head very quickly. You need to be able to identify an aromatic molecule based on these four criteria. And each and every one of these criteria must be met. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And rarely have you heard me say something that definitive, right? So if you have three of the four criteria, you can't say, well, it's sort of aromatic. It ain't aromatic, OK? The first rule is a molecule must be cyclic. What do I mean by that? What does it mean to be cyclic? Pardon? All right, so for example, if we look at benzene, the way that I like to think about it, if I started at one point, I can go through every carbon and get back to my starting point without ever, out, ever lifting my writing utensil. That's a cyclic molecule. It forms a ring, right? So the first rule is it must be cyclic. So if we look at this example, right, here's a cyclic compound. This kind of looks like benzene. Hey, I've got six carbon atoms with three double bonds, just like benzene has, but it's not cyclic because to go from here to here, I would actually have to lift my pencil, wouldn't I? This is not an aromatic compound, okay? The reason it has to be cyclic is because all these orbitals have to overlap. And the only way that that can happen is if it is a cyclic molecule, okay? So benzene, of course, they're not showing the double bonds here, but benzene would be aromatic. This molecule, even though it kind of looks like it, ain't aromatic because it's not cyclic. It's acyclic. That's rule number one. Rule number two, the molecule must be planar. All the atoms of the aromatic system must lie in the same plane. Okay? So, for example, if you looked at cyclooctatetrene, okay, stop sign with four double bonds in it, right? Kind of a joke, stop sign. Okay, so you got the stop sign with four double bonds in it, right? As it's drawn here, you might think it's planar. I dare you to go home and build your model of this. It will not lie in a plane. It wants to fold up and be a tub. Okay? And so since it folds up and takes on this tub shape, it's actually can't be aromatic. Okay? So rule number one, cyclic. Rule number two, planar. And in fact, we can test this hypothesis because we can take cyclooctatetraene and react it with bromine, and lo and behold, it will decolorize bromine. Bromine will add across the carbon-carbon double bond, and it will continue to add across the carbon-carbon double bond until we've completely reacted all of the uh, pi bonds, okay? If it was aromatic, that wouldn't happen, right? And so we could actually do that little experiment. So we've got rule number one, which is cyclic, rule number two, which is planar. Rule number three is that the molecule must be completely conjugated. That means that there must be a p orbital on every atom. So if I look at benzene, I've got a p orbital, 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 and a p orbital. All six carbon atoms have a p orbital on them because they're all sp2 hybridized. So this would be an aromatic compound. It would satisfy uh, all three criteria that we've talked about so far. Okay. Notice here we've got P, 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 none, none. Right? It is cyclic. It's not planar. If you build a model, you'll see that. So it doesn't satisfy that to start with. But it also doesn't satisfy the completely conjugated rule. Okay. 
So you have to have a completely conjugated system. So criteria one is? Must be cyclic. Two? Planar. Rule three? Completely conjugated. And this takes us to our last but not least, some people would actually say most important rule, Huckel's rule. The molecule must satisfy Huckel's rule and contain a particular number of pi electrons. Not all pi electron counts count to be aromatic. Okay? So an aromatic compound must satisfy this simple little equation, 4n plus 2. 4 times n plus 2 must equal the number of pi electrons. This is as complicated as math usually gets in organic chemistry. It's why I'm an organic chemist. Okay? I didn't like my calculus classes. Okay? n has to be a whole number. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It can't be a fraction. Okay? So if I have a system that is cyclic, planar, completely conjugated, and satisfies Huckel's rule, I've got an aromatic compound. So let's look at this. So benzene has how many electrons? One in each p orbital. It's got six pi electrons, right? Two, four, six. So four in plus 2 must equal 6, 4n equal 4, so n equal 1. That satisfies Huckel's rule. You just have to find n being a whole number and you're good to go. Now, if we look at cyclobutadiene, it can be cyclic. I can build a model that shows it being planar. It is completely conjugated. But it does not satisfy Huckel's rule. Right? 4n plus 2 equal 4. 4n equal 2. So n has to be 1 half. It does not satisfy Huckel's rule, therefore it cannot be aromatic. However, it does satisfy this little equation. 4n equals the number of pi electrons. That means it's anti-aromatic. So molecules can be non-aromatic, which means they're just regular old alkenes. They can be aromatic, which means they're unusually stable. Or they can be anti-aromatic, which means what? They're unusually reactive. Cyclobutadiene has never been made and put into a bottle and stored. It has been generated for fleeting seconds at low, low temperatures and observed by spectroscopic techniques. And as soon as it's generated, it reacts with whatever it can because it is extraordinarily reactive. Yes, ma'am. It does. It does. So to be anti-aromatic, you have to be cyclic, you have to be planar, you have to be conjugated, but you have to satisfy 4n equal the number of pi electrons. So on an exam, what would be fair game? I'm going to give you a bunch of molecules. I'm going to ask you which of the following are aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic. And you have to be able to use these rules to determine where you're at, uh, what, what, you're, what you're doing. Okay? Anti-aromatic means that it is unusually reactive. We can't isolate it. Can it be anti-aromatic without meaning the one, two, and three? It's located one, two, and three, but fails the rule to the four and six pi. Well, it can fail Huckel's rule. If it fails Huckel's rule, it doesn't necessarily make it the molecule anti-aromatic. Right. Yep. Does that make sense? All right. So if we look at the example, all of these uh, values of n, as I mentioned to you, work. So if n is 0, that means you'd have 2 pi electrons. If n is 1, you'd have 6. 2, you'd have 10. 3, you'd have 14. If you had 4, you'd have 18 pi electrons. And we actually have systems that are aromatic that have this many pi electrons. Okay? Benzene is just a real simple system to think about. The anulenes are aromatic compounds. If we look at these molecules, notice 
each atom has a p uh, orbital on it, right? Uh, they are cyclic. I mean, you can obviously see, right? There's, there's a ring. They are planar. Build a model. They will lay perfectly flat in a ring. Okay? And they do satisfy Huckel's rule. So here I've got 14 pi electrons. 4n plus 2, right? n becomes 3. It's an aromatic system. Doesn't look anything like benzene, does it? Here we have 18 annuline, 18 pi electrons. It is also an aromatic system. It satisfies all four of the criteria that we need for aromaticity. Okay? All of those things that I just told you, you're taking at faith value. I told you it must be true, right? But how do we know that those criteria hold? We know that those criteria hold because of orbitals and bonding theory. Okay? When we look at the orbitals for cyclobutadiene and when we look at the orbitals for benzene, we can understand why benzene is stable and why cyclobutadiene is extraordinarily reactive. When we look at the orbitals and where the electrons are, we can figure that out. Okay? And we are going to pick up with this on Friday. I want you to read about the polygon method, also known as the Frost Circle, for determining molecular orbitals. Turns out us organic chemists have real easy ways of determining where the orbital energies are for these systems that make it a heck of a lot easier than how you did this in Gen Chem. So it's going to be a lot easier, but you need to read ahead. Be ready for Friday. Go ahead and turn in your inverted lecture up here at the front on your way out. I'm a little bit behind on my grading, and I apologize, but I will have at least the last two assignments uh, turned back to you on Friday. Hopefully I will have this one as well turned back to you on Friday.